explain in dummy terms for me exactly what the most fundamental basis of what a quantum computer is? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I, you know, classical computers are based on, I mean, you know, essentially a computer is based on something that has two states, a binary state, right? Uh, I'm going back to Shannon, actually, really. Um, so, you know, whether it's on or off, um, that you can store information, you can, if you change everything to zeros and ones, yeah. then you can have an array of uh, circuits that are on or off, you know, and you can have an on car, open correspond to, you know, a zero, a closed correspond to a one. So you could, you know, think about that. You can, you can arrange circuits that would, you know, basically be in a state of the zeros and ones, right? Right. That would, you know, encode information. Um, but um, with, what we know is that um, at the quantum level, quantum mechanical objects, um, they can exist in different states at the same time. So basically this is the strange thing about quantum mechanics, that the quantum mechanics, and it's something where, yes, you know, you just, you raised your eyebrows and it's just, a, yes. I'm starting to melt what, my brain here. Okay, what does that mean? And it's, you know, it's hard to, comprehend because our brain, it is hard to think about what does, that, what does that mean? But I'll give you an example, the simplest example, or one of the best I've seen is, if you think about a coin, so okay, so a coin can be, you know, up or down, mm -hmm. okay? So heads a coin is heads or tails, a coin is heads or tails. Um, and that sort of, you know, corresponds to a classical, you know, chip, basically a bit. Okay, that it can be one or the other, just like a, an electronic switch could be on or off. But what if I spin the coin and I say, well, what is it a heads or a tail when it's spinning? Hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, it technically has the, the little tiny edge around it. It has, the, it has the edge, but exactly. But it's, you know, it is in, it is, it's really in both states at that point, right? right. Until, it, until it falls. Until right. it, and that, that is essentially a, a, a parallel to way, the way we think nature works, that nature um, is not in fixed states at the quantum level. Um, when, we want, when we observe them, we see one state or the other. But uh, in the interim period, it is in both. And so um, if you think of uh, you know, a, a classical computer, you know, everything is fixed. Everything is, you know, it's either on switch or off switch. And so that is, you know, so any, a single switch um, can have two possibilities. It can be open or closed. Yeah, I can open a window or a program on my laptop, turn it, use it, edit a video on it or shut it down and it's, right? Yeah, but this is even more basic than that is just, you know, what, what do you do when you open a program? You know, it's, it's going in there and, you know, there are physical, you know, there are physical, you know, electronics that are, you know, uh, either the current is going through here where there's a one or it's not going through here or zero. Okay. And, you know, just think of everything as a sequence of zeros and ones, right? Just okay. everything, every instruction, every piece of information, you know, the color red is, you know, this, this is this, the, the letter A, you know, just think about how, you know, we, we code a letter and come up with it. We, we have a, you know, there's a certain accepted string of zeros and ones that corresponds to A. Okay. A different strat, a different one that corresponds to D to B. Okay. Everything. So right. everything has a certain code to it. Okay. Um, but in a in a in a, in a in a computer, those zeros and ones, each one of them is a a circuit, a, a switch that's on or off. Okay. Okay. And so each one of those switches is either just one or two things. But a quantum object, something that that is actually behaving at a quantum mechanical level, a switch is much too big for quantum mechanics to be effect. It's a big thing. It's not, not, it's not just an atom. But an atom itself, or an electron or something like that, it's, it's in a quantum mechanical state. It's like the spinning coin. And so it can 
be both at the same time. So, you know, unlike in a classical computer where a switch is, it's either open or closed. Okay. An, a, 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 an atom or an electron is spinning and it could be either up or down or in between. And so intrinsically, it, it can hold more information than this thing that's just up or down, right? The, 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 the spinning coin can intrinsically be including both information at the same time. Um, just depending on how you're looking at it? Yeah. Okay. It, it, it depends on how you will look. It, it depends on what you do to actually look at it at the end. So if you can put in, you can basically, whereas in the, in the switch, you can only either say it's either zero or one. In that atom, you can, you can say it's both at the same time. And then the trick is how do you get the, you know, how do you observe it and see what, what is the thing that you want? So, okay. so the idea... Go ahead, of a, a, the idea of with, the, with, the, with the quantum computer is that um, if we can make components that actually operate quantum mechanically, there's a potential for storing a huge amount of information, um, much greater amount of information uh, at the same time than you could in the, you know, with, a, with just a classical computer with, with, with chips. Okay. So, so the main advantage to a quantum computer is just storing way more information. Way more information and being able to do, uh, uh, to be able to do calculations that are much, much more complex than you could ever do with a classical one, because it would just take forever to do the classical one. So, so, so things that would basically take forever, literally for as long as the universe has existed, there might be a possibility to do it with a quantum because it can just operate, uh, you know, at, with so much more capacity and, and simultaneously. So, so like, for example, if we're talking about something like virtual reality or augmented reality, something this is done with a traditional computer with the same type of in information, ones and zeros. So yeah. if you could imagine something like augmented reality on steroids, like times a million, more than more than a million even yeah really yeah yeah so i mean things that th things that we think would take you know uh, yeah it would, it's, a, it's 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 a completely different level of, of magnitude but the problem is um it's very they're very hard to do so we do there are quantum computers now um but they are very limited in what they can do because one of the problems is how do you manipulate things at that at that scale and they're very unstable um, you know, when you're dealing with atoms, you know, as soon as you, if you, you know, as soon as you perturb them, they, they, you know, fall apart or they lose their, mm -hmm. their orientation. Um, so generally, you know, they have to be done at super, super cool temperatures so that there's no heat in, in, impacting it and things like that. Mm. And uh, so, you know, there's, this is, it's still, you know, it's another controversial thing. It's again, one of these things, um, at this point, um, it's incredibly fascinating and, and theoretically intriguing. And, but there is debate in the field. Is this, you know, uh, like the LHC? I mean, in a sense, is quantum computing, is it going to be practical? Well, and, I mean, it, isn't a huge question also is how are biological organisms like us going to be able to interact with it if, it's, if it can store and and quantify this massive amount of data how can monkeys like us interact with it in a meaningful way just like an iphone like a like these amazing devices we only have our two thumbs mm -hmm. we can only do so much with an iphone um so like the the input output with a human being like we, we can type with our fingers on a keyboard there's only mm -hmm. so much that we can do to interact with these computers so like, isn't one of the big questions, how are we going to be able to integrate with them to be able to do or learn anything meaningful? Well, yes, um, but we do that through a regular computer. So as I say, there are 
you know, there are uh, quantum computers that exist. In fact, IBM has made one available to anybody. They've put it, you basically, you can access it, uh, uh, you know, uh, if you go on the web and you look up IBM Q system, they have set it up and you interact with it like a regular computer. So the, the, pro the point of, of quantum computers is that the input and the output are regular computers. Mm. So we, will, we, interact, we interact with them. So, you know, your point is a very good point is that the way we interact with them is classically because that's the way we interact with things. So, so the input is classical information. So we are, you're on a regular computer and you're writing a program. Now what those programs look like, that's the big, one of the big challenges is how, what is the language to use for quantum computing? But there are people that are working on that. And, and as I say, there are, there's online now you can go online and there's a whole thing about you know play with a quantum computer and it's you know their the idea of ibm is they want to try to get people engaged and start to explore what they can do but you go on and you write you know you can program something and it sends bits it sends zeros and ones to the quantum computer down to you know down to these whatever the system is there's many many quantum systems you can use and it sends it down there and it encodes the information in a quantum system. And then you have to get that out of the quantum system and, and then translate it back into your classical computer. Doesn't so that take the, the fun away from it though? What, what fun? <laughs> I mean, doesn't that take like the, ex, like interacting with a quantum computer? I mean, you're, you have, there's a, uh, a 2D or a, a regular binary buffer between you and the quantum computer. Like, wouldn't it be cool if you could just somehow directly interface with the quantum computer and eliminate all of the, all of the barriers that <laughs> our, our biological bodies inhibit us from? Well, it's not, it's not so much the biological bodies. Well, except that, you know, look, we are, we are entities that interact with our world through our senses. So at some, you know, um, at some level, you have to interact with physical things. Um, you know, the fact is quantum, you know, we can't possibly imagine, you know, we, we don't have the uh, ability to, to, to pick up an atom, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> so, so at some level, you need something that actually interacts with the atom. And it's certainly nothing that we ever could do. We can't, you know, we can't, we, 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 we can't pick an atom up and move it. Um, we can do it with a lot of devices and they do. In fact, you know, we can move atoms now, actually. I mean, we can actually um, move them around, um, but, you know, not with our hands. We have, you know, we have these huge electron microscopes and, you know, um, scanning tunneling microscopes that can, you know, actually, you know, they're, they're enormous machines to interact with something at a quantum level. So, so at some level, you have to have machines that are doing it. And, um, you know, uh, we just have to have, because of our physical limitations, we have to, we have to interact with, with, with a machine that can do it. We can't, I, you know, I don't think there's ever any hope that we're going to actually be able to, you know, what's going to change. We you just, you can't move an atom with your, with your fingers, you know, right. no matter what, how good a surgeon you are. <laughs> right. So you need equipment to do it. We, we, we are dependent on tools at, at, at a certain, at that level, you know, I mean, that's an, it is an interesting philosophical question is in a sense, you know, at the quantum level, we, we know it through the tools. We know, we know the world at the fundamental level at CERN too. It's not like anybody ever really sees in a classical sense, you know, with light, a Higgs boson. Mm -hmm. It's all, it's all uh, many it's all steps me measured, removed. right? It's all measured from these devices that we've, you know, we've come up with our tools, our, you know, our tools, uh, you know, the way we understand the universe is, is basically through whatever tools we use to observe it. And so, you know, at, at the macroscopic level, we have our eyes, um, and, you know, there's some perception of it, but the, the, our picture of the universe is based on, you know, our biology of how we see things. But 
as soon as we get beyond things that we can see, then it's based on the data and tools that we have and the picture that we draw from that. Right. right? I mean, we will never, you know, what does it, what does an atom look like? Um, it's, uh, it's based on something that these machines uh, give us a, an answer to and a picture of. Um, so uh, there's that abstraction of, you know, our, the, 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 you know, the way the universe looks is based on the way we look at it, whatever tools we have, if, if a tool looks at it this way and it, it can detect this part of it, then that's, then we construct an image of it from that. Didn't we recently actually get like a, an image from a telescope of a black hole? Yeah, uh, 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 multiple telescopes. Yeah, I mean, uh, so we have an idea uh, of what it could look like. Yeah, uh, it looks like a black hole uh, a with, black. with with a ring around it. No, it does. It was very exciting. I mean, it was, you know, and again, it was. Uh, uh, but again, there, you know, telescope. Um, it's an abstraction. It's looking at electromagnetic radiation. There are these big radio telescopes that are looking, and it was basically done by using multiple ones all around the earth. Right. So, um, so yes, but it is true. And, 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 and again, it's another example where we've created this image, but it's based on, you know, I mean, the, the, these things that, you know, look like radar dishes and, you know, telescopes. I mean, they're, they're, they're gaining all this data and then they combined it all, you know, very, in very sophisticated ways to make a composite image of, of a black hole, which was, yeah, I mean, it's very exciting to actually see, you know, what, what this looks like. And, you know, the hope is that we can study it and study the, you know, what happens around the perimeter and things like that. So, um, look, I mean, the idea of a black, black hole was initially just an anomaly. I mean, it was in Einstein's theory of general relativity that there was this, this you know, this problem that it predicted these things where everything blew up basically. Um, and for a long time, it just was regarded as a mathematical anomaly. And then, you know, people began to think, well, actually, maybe can we study these things? Maybe, maybe it's not just something where the math falls apart. Maybe we can actually learn something about these mathematically. And eventually people did begin to figure things out about it. And now, we think we've, you know, we predicted that they were existing and now we've seen one, you know, and, and, you know, so first it was just, we could see that there was evidence of one, as I talked about before, you could see things rotating around something that was black and it was so heavy that you had to think it may not be a black hole. And now with this new thing that you, the image that you've seen, they actually see it, you know.